Jessica. Hello, everyone. Hello, Janana. Hello, hi, Seymour. I will wait a few seconds. Um, I'm sure. Uh, hello. Um, Kitty is getting ready. Can you hear? Everyone can hear me well? Hi, hi, Seymour. Hi, hello. Today, as you can see, I usually do my conversations on Tuesdays, possibly Wednesdays. Today is extraordinary, I should say, session, uh, because we have an extraordinary person um, who is extremely busy, and I'm so grateful that Kitty found her time to join us tonight. So uh, I'm looking forward to see her just in a sec. And we will start. Hi, India. So nice to see familiar names waving to me, and thank you very much. For joining. Just a little bit of patience. You know, since Kitty is now on the other side of the world. She's in Europe uh, right now. She's actually in Milan, I believe. Yes, she's in Milan. Um, so we just need to give her a chance to connect. One day I will have these conversations in the real life and hi Leah. Um, and I will have the person of my friend talking to all of you next to me. I'm sure. Here you go, Kitty. Kitty is joining us. I'm just connecting to her right now. Hello. Hello. Hi, Olga. How are you? How are you? So good to see you. And you too. So lovely to see you. So lovely, lovely to see you too. Okay. Thank you, my dear. How was your trip yesterday? How was your flight? Uh, it was uh, this, mor uh, this morning. Oh, it was this morning. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, but it was good. Very happy to be back in Italy always. So, yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you once again. I know how busy you are, but... Uh, no, I've been really Everybody wanted to see your gorgeous self and to talk to you and to listen to you, so I'm very much privileged. I will say a few words about uh, the conversations with Olga. I will also introduce you very briefly before we move on with uh, our exciting conversation. Okay. Perfect. Wonderful. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good evening, Asia. Good morning, New York, and good afternoon, Europe. Um, I will say a few words about my series, and um, some of you join me for now, tonight is our 26th episode, actually. So some of you are very new, so I'll say a few words. Uh, I've started conversations with Olga last year during the circuit breaker, because I had so much more time, uh, and I've decided to connect to my beautiful friends, to people whom I've met throughout my career, uh, influential individuals who uh, from all around the world. These beautiful people are sharing their life stories and uh, uh, in hopes to inspire and uh, cultivate a more diverse and inclusive community. As I said to tonight, today is my 26th episode and uh, it's my immense honor to welcome Lady Kitty Spencer to my uh, conversations with Olga. Uh, Kitty is an eldest child of Charles Spencer, the ninth Earl Spencer, and a niece of Diana, the Princess of Wales. In 1995, Kitty's parents, Charles Spencer and Victoria Lockwood, moved their family from London to Cape Town to escape the spotlight. Uh, when Kitty, you were 18, uh, you posted for the post for the first time for the Tatler 
you, uh, magazine in UK, and I believe that was your first uh, introduction to the society. Uh, and am I correct to say that? I think I mean, I I think I think that is uh, correct. It might well my the very first one was with my mother when I was little. We did a we oh, did a okay. cover together. <laughs> okay. And that was okay. um, I think I was. Uh, well, my sisters, my mother was pregnant with my sisters, so we always love that image because you you can't see that she's pregnant, but I'm sitting on her lap. So I, we all know it's the four of us, but it looks like it's just the two of us. Um, so oh, we all we all have that photograph. Oh, and that was um, that was when Harpers was still Harpers and Queens. So that was okay. Um, yes. Uh, That's a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful little story. And when you, you moved to London at the age of 22 to do your master's in luxury business uh, management after studying Italian and uh, art in Florence for three years. Yes. Uh, and uh, just recently, you married Michael Lewis, a South African-born British businessman mm -hmm. in the fashion industry and chairman for Foschini Group. Congratulations once again. <laughs> the wedding took place at the Villa Albondrandini, correct? Alto Brandini in Pascal. It took me a while to. In July 24th. <laughs> I have to brush up on my Italian. <laughs> July 24th. So, congratulations again. And uh, we'll talk about everything with regards to what you've been wearing and uh, the festivities as well, of course. Uh, I would like to start, dear Kitty, with uh, your bringing. You were born to the aristocratic family, but you have described your childhood as a simple one, with walking around uh, bare feet and uh, your dad making sure you lived on a budget to teach you the real life and the value of money, which is ex extraordinary, and that's what uh, I think um, most of us, I certainly did for my children as well, uh, I believe your growing up years have been fundamentally different from the world you live right now in. Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Absolutely. Well, um, as you say, I mean, I was, uh, it was my fifth birthday when we um, landed in South Africa for a holiday. And um, I think we just had such a wonderful, wonderful time together. And it was a, really a, a whole new world. And um, when we look back at uh, albums now that my, my mother's made over the years, you know, we, we really were barefoot and, you know, she would take us away for weekends where we, we could row boats yeah. on the dam and pick fruit and not me, but my siblings milk cows and, you know, so it was all sort of, they we did all these sort of wholesome, lovely things. And because we we're so close in age, it was really, um, you know, we were like a little team and it was, uh, it was really just the most wonderful upbringing. And I love, it was a very a, a tight knit community. Everybody knew everybody's families. You know, if someone was your friend, it meant that you could drop into their home whenever you wanted and you knew their mother and you knew their siblings. And, and that's, what, yeah. um, that's what I really love um, about the South African culture. It's very family oriented. Yeah, that was actually my, my uh, next question to you. What was the fundamental experience was it for you when you were growing up in South Africa? What 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 the most staples of memories for you? Well, memories, I think, um, in terms of personality and character development, I think that the most fundamental thing that I learned about that time was my mother was raising us, you know, alone, and it was four, four children under four, four and five, and, um, and my yes. sister the twins, so Louis was one, the twins were three, and I was, I had just turned five, and um, I think that you learn to be part of a team in the best possible way, I, you learn, you learn that you can't be selfish, that your opinion isn't necessarily the right one, um, and I think it's really important to learn how to be an individual, but 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 part of a team. And yes. um, and I think that the reason we're so close uh, today is um, is because of that. Is because we were we were you know we were very very tight knit, but there there were a lot of us. And um, uh, but it was just a really wonderful way to grow up and we often say to each other how are we going to 
how we, how do we replicate a childhood like that for you know for, for yeah. our children, and how do we make sure that they have the same experiences? So, um, so I have to say Thank I'm you. very grateful to my mother for for giving us that upbringing, and I yes. and I I hope it shaped who I am today, and and um, whatever it has shaped can only be uh, for the better. Uh, I'm very sure, and talking about that, I'm sure you know. I always taught my children the importance of good manners, and I talk about it subject a fair bit through my interviews, through projects I create, and in my upcoming, actually, new book. Uh, could you please share with us, and you just did, how important uh, some of the lessons have been for you from your, from your mother. Uh, how important do you think is uh, manners, to, to learn a good manners in general? I think it's something that goes uh, both ways, because when you have manners and you treat people properly, you're, you know, showing that you value that person, that it, you know, treating people as you'd like to be treated. But you're also it's self-respect as well. You know the way you Absolutely. conduct yourself. And I think yes. um, my mother was uh, she was very strict on the important things. You know, she um, eye contact and thanking people and thank you letters and you know it was. Uh, the important, the important things, and and I think that they really do count, especially in this uh, day and age where um, I don't know everything's so fast paced and so instant that I think it's yes. You, I think to write a, a thank you letter rather than you know a text or an email. A text, send a text. Yes, exactly. Or emoji, even more. Yeah, exactly. I think it. Yes. I think it counts for more today yes. than, than it did. You know, then when it was the norm. So I'm, I'm relieved that she brought us up with some some old-fashioned um, values. I think Thank I'll you. do the same. I think, <laughs> I hope. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm very sure. I have no doubts about it. <laughs> um, what is your typical day like? What is your? It's it's routine? not typical, which is what's which is what's great and what's uh, that's what I feel very lucky because I had always hoped that I would find a role or path in life that would avoid um, monotony uh, or, or, or too much predictability. So um, as the balance between having my family in South Africa and, and in England and um, and working for Dolce and Gabbana, who are always doing something exciting somewhere. Extraordinary, and yes. And the two uh, charities, Centerpoint, and give us time. It creates a wonderful balance where days aren't too typical or uh, predictable, which 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 suits which suits me. Um, you know, very much. Uh, very happy to uh, to not know what, what's what's coming next, but just to um, and raise how do you relax? What what are your well, the, principles of relaxation or advice? advice? Well, because my sisters have just moved to London, so now I have my brother and my sisters in London, and so for me, um, a relaxing day is just to have them over to my house and just we just catch up, and that's how how it used to be for us in South Africa. But for many years, we haven't all been living in the same place, and now they're actually here in Milan, so. After this, I'll go and find them and have a catch-up. And that, for, for me, is the most relaxing thing. Oh, my God, of course. It's to be with them and you just feel totally um, totally at ease. And uh, and to, for, to have them over to, to, to my house and, to, and, to, and just to be together is really something that I'm appreciating so much more now that they've moved to England. You're, you're all are very, very lucky to be together. And I yeah. feel it. It's wonderful. My kids are far away. I haven't seen them for a long time. They're in New York. So I I am so... How long has that been? Well, it's been uh, for more than one and a half years since pandemic. So, yeah. So, but I'm actually planning a short trip to Germany just to meet them. They will fly from New York to Germany and I will fly from Singapore to Germany because now we don't have a currency in between two countries. So I'm just taking this opportunity and uh, flying for one week just to meet them and my mom. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, yes, yes. Um, I would like to ask you a little bit about, because you have a love for the fashion industry and it become, I guess, this one of your 
first sh uh, photo shoots with us, maybe with Stadler. How did it feel shooting a cover from a magazine for the first time? Do you remember? Um, it was... Uh, it was After funny. living especially a very private life at that well, time. Well, yeah, I suppose, yeah, I was living in South Africa at the time and um, I, I came over for the school holidays and um, so it was... Um, I, it was something so surreal and I didn't really know what to expect and this was pre-Instagram era, pre-sort of too much social media so it was very much this thing that I just did one day on holiday and then it you know, came out a little later and then we got the magazines far later than that in South Africa so it wasn't something that, that really impacted my day-to-day -day life but it was a shoot that I was you know, really proud of and happy with, it was a wonderful Yes. first experience to have and I remember um, I remember the double page spread there was I was uh, blowing bubbles you know like one of those children's things of bubbles yes, yes. in this beautiful white dress and it was actually a Dolce & Gabbana dress so it was, I imagine that that must have been my first time wearing Dolce & Gabbana but evidently not the last and evidently not the first yes, the last yes, time I wore a white dress of this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I will talk about your global ambassador's Padolce and Cabana role just in a few minutes. And I will start with, of course, with your beautiful uh, wedding just now to Michael. The wedding took place uh, about 20 kilometers, as I mentioned, from Rome, I believe. It's a very, very cultural uh, uh, It's a uh, place that is... Uh, Frascati, uh, that is known for the, I believe, for a number of scientific laboratories, as well as very cultural and art, art enhanced place. And uh, uh, you, um, I enjoyed very much looking at the pictures and the videos, just like uh, most of us, I guess, uh, who are now uh, present with us tonight. And congratulations one again, once again. Kitty, you were wearing this incredibly beautiful dress uh, from Alta Moda, from Dolce & Cabana, and uh, Alta Gelleria, beautiful pieces. Uh, can you please share with us uh, how the dresses were chosen for the pre-wedding activities as well as the wedding itself? And just to remind everyone, uh, Kitty is the global ambassador for Dolce & Cabana, so um, she definitely... Uh, knows in, uh, in very much of the details, uh, so many intricacies about the beautiful creations from the brand. Thank you. Well, it was, um, it, the whole process was really such a wonderful prelude to the weekend that was obviously the most, uh, you know, it was the most wonderful few days of, of my life. Um, and it, to have this run up was just was just incredible coming here to actually where I'm sitting now to 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 meet with Domenico and Stefano and and, and to see the, the sketches and the ideas that they had and they know me so well and they know you know what I love and yes. and and also what suits me because, because you know sometimes those things aren't aren't the same so they they find yes. they did such a wonderful job of um, of of making something suit me, but that represented me as well. They know how much I love Italy. They know how much, um, how inspired I am by Italian craftsmanship. And they, um, but that I also am very proud of my British heritage. So they, they, uh, they found a way to, to bring the two together in a way that was really um, magnificent to watch and to, to be a part of. And, um, and everything was just done with such care and precision. Yes, the details were incredible. The details were, were really incredible. Um, and the, the the dress that I wore on the first night for the welcome dinner, the baby blue tool, and they were, the seamstresses were there checking every flower literally until the moment I got in the lift to go. The, the attention to detail was unlike anything I have ever seen. And uh, the, the necklace I wore that night, the pink sapphires. Yes, yes. I, that had taken eight, eight years to put together. Um, so before I met my So it was, uh, so it was that, that, you know, to find all of the pink sapphires that were the right color and the layout of the necklace, to think that that took so long. Um, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's a, a real testament to Italian craftsmanship. And, uh, yes. 
the next uh, for the actual wedding day um the second wedding dress was uh, was was hand painted and um and that's what was incredible to me is uh, uh, even the the most the, the men that i would um wouldn't have expected to to sort of necessarily notice much of the details some of my friends husbands were going oh my goodness it's hand painted and look at how these flowers are as you know it, it, everyone was just could appreciate the the detail when you know when you see it for yourself it was truly something quite incredible and for that one the necklace was uh was uh, looked like ivy and it was um inspired by leonardo da vinci's garden here uh, that he had in Milan while he was painting um, the Last Supper, um, and uh, Alta Giulia actually. I thought goosebumps. It was. It's amazing. <laughs> it's every little, every little aspect had so much thought and detail, and um, and actually that dress was hand painted to look like the Aldo Brandini Nymphaeum where we were married. So it had yes. the details. So, which uh, made me nervous for a moment with the. Trying, trying to plan, I thought, well, best we don't change locations now, and best the, <laughs> so the wedding can still go ahead. Yes. But it, it, it was so beautiful, um, and it was it was just such a wonderful process to watch it all come to life. And uh, you know, I was very lucky that when I saw my actual wedding dress for the first time, my mother and brother were here with me, um, and just to to see the experience through their eyes too. Um, it was my brother's first time in Milan and first time seeing a sibling in a wedding dress, you know, and it was really an emotional day for all of us that we can never imagine. forget. You know, I was crying, they were crying, <laughs> the designers were crying, you know, it was a, it were, there yeah. were a lot of happy tears and a lot of, a lot of laughter yeah. and happy moments. It was really, the build up was, was, was just as wonderful actually as, as, as the wedding itself. It was such an important part of it and added so much to to what was that, you know, eventually the, the wedding itself. It's extraordinary. I, as I said, I'm having goosebumps just listening to you about the, about all these details. And uh, how long did it take to design uh, the main dress? Or and there actually most of the dresses are painted. <laughs> it was uh, it was it took um, six months and really, uh, I mean, the most highly skilled um, artists. Yes, artisans. Yes, of course. A, 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 a big, a big team, and uh, a lot of, a lot of love and care that went into it. Um, uh, and and I could feel that really in every fitting, just just from just from everybody, you know, uh, the the care that they would take over whether the ribbon was that much shorter. Or that, you know, every little thing was was. Um, was thought out. It's and, a uh, creation. It's an art. It, uh, to absolutely. me, they are art pieces. And uh, that actually brings me to the question, uh, where will these dresses be kept? Because sometimes they are, are they going to be, have they been brought back into the archives of Dolce and Gabbana or are they kept with you at home? Um, I th think they're back here. Um, well, they are, they, are, they are back here. The, uh, actually, the dress that I wore on the Sunday was the very first look from the very first Altamoda collection, mm -hmm. um, the Talmina collection, which is, which so that in itself is, I mean, a real masterpiece. That that's, yes, I think that'll be in the archives forever. And it was, uh, you know, they were kind enough to 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 make some alterations. They okay. added some green velvet ribbon. And they made it. It was incredible. That you know, they adapted it to me, just to despite the fact that it's, yes, it's a wonderful masterpiece. They still want you to enjoy it and wear it and, and, and feel like yourself in it and uh, that was a, a real masterpiece and to be able to say this is look one of collection one of Altamuda and next year's the 10 year anniversary of course it was really yeah. very special um, but I think the I think the dresses are are, are probably in this in this building somewhere I assume I'm not yeah. actually well, sure they deserve, I should they deserve ask. To be they deserve to be preserved for generations, and I hope that one day perhaps your daughter will and wear at least me. one of those dresses because uh, they're definitely extraordinary and it, you know, it will create the even stronger, I think, connection uh, yeah. of the house of Dolce & Cabana and Alta Moda and uh, yeah. to, to you as well. I agree. 
I, you know, I think, fingers crossed, um, fingers crossed my, my daughter or daughters where one day I, I can't imagine that they'd find anything um, better. So I think they'll awesome. probably be very happy. <laughs> yes, exactly. And moving, staying still with, with the arts and places and the cultural places, I know that you, uh, you enrolled uh, in an online course quite recently at the same school in Florence that you went uh, to study when you lived in Florence. And, you, and I will quote uh, your words. Uh, at the time, you reflected as being the happiest of my life. Everything felt so simple and carefree, but you are still being stimulated in a culturally rich environment. It's just pure pleasure and learning and being surrounded by very type of but by every type of beauty. That's your words. What drew you to Florence in the beginning? I think it was the it was my first trip to Italy was to Florence. So what and I've had this enduring love borderline obsession with Italy since I just and, and it started with Florence. When I was 15, I went there on a family holiday, and um, I remember just thinking to myself, or I'm saying to my family, I'd love to retire here one day. And then I had this gap of time because the academic year in South Africa is to the end of uh, end it's to December, so and yes. I was starting in London in September. I had this gap, September. so then I thought, well, I suppose you can't assume that you'll be lucky enough to live to, to retire. I thought I should, should go now and, and uh, you know, and, and experience it, uh, and experience it now. And I'm, I'm really glad that I did. And that, uh, I was studying politics at the time in South Africa and a girl on my course, a very dear friend said, I did, I did this course in Florence before I got there and you should go and do it. And so we sort of did a trade. She came and she was doing oh, politics okay. from then on. And I, and I, and I moved to Florence and I decided very quickly, I think it was a, a matter of days from when I decided to when I left. And, um, and, and as, you, as you quoted it, it's, it's a, a strange feeling when you are in something and you know that it's that happiest time of your life. Normally it's only with the, the benefit of hindsight that you know whether something is good for you or bad for you. But, yes. but Florence just had this magic and, and wonderment and um and you it was just so enriching to be, and to be learning so much and but but we weren't sitting at desks learning we were standing in front of the David it's learning a, about the yeah, David was standing, you know in front yeah. of it. it was I mean coming from South Africa and having had everything wonderful that South Africa has to to offer but this was something completely different and to be yes, of course you know in the heart of the Renaissance and and, and standing in front of things I think I was uh, tearing up every day. I think they probably thought I was, you know. And that, <laughs> but, and but that was really it meant the world to me. And I knew it at the time, and I felt lucky that I knew it at the time, and that I, I didn't need the benefit of hindsight to appreciate it. Yes, and that I guess I, I believe that your interest in arts probably was sparked from Florence by Florence, wasn't absolutely. it? Absolutely, and. I, you know, as you said, I did some some more online courses during lockdown. So not quite the same, but I, you know, it was just it's that emotional attachment, attachment that I had at that yes. time. And uh, I mean, it's just a treasure box. That's uh, I, I just I it's truly the most wonderful place in the world, and um, just opened my eyes to, to to Italy. And I guess it was also my first time living away from home and as close yes. as we all are, it was my first taste of um, independence and of, of making a decision that was purely my own and based on how uh, what 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 I felt in, interests me and and the sides of my um, you know areas of learning that I'd like to develop and and I didn't feel that I knew nearly enough or nearly as much as I wanted to and that's why I chose my yes. And that's, and that's why I went there and I just, it's the greatest thing I ever did. 
So I, I have a feeling somehow that you, one day, and you mentioned it yourself, maybe, of course, retirement is not the word, especially for you or in these days in general, but I feel that you probably will spend quite a bit of time, eventually more time in Florence. I hope so. I really hope so. I hope that, um, yeah, I hope to have a base there. I hope to, any, I, I've never, you know, had an unhappy memory there. And of course, that's wonderful. That, that means the energy is very pure and very strong too. Very. And yes. it's all showing the one who did their automotive show there in September. And so for yes. me, that was, that Sorry. was everything. I love coming together at once. So yeah. that, those few days that will probably, yes. you know, I mean, up there with, with anything I've experienced. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thank you for that. Um, I would like to, you're, you're incredibly kind and incredibly charitable person. I would like to talk a little bit about your philanthropic, philanthropic work and uh, this feeling of helplessness has pervaded in recent months, I think, for many of us. And I'm aware of your immense support uh, uh, through your work in the, um, it is a homelessness uh, charity center point and uh, give us time which assists military families can you please tell us a little bit about your support about your about the projects about the projects itself and about charities uh, uh, in particular that you support so give us time um, was a small but growing military charity that was uh, and the patron of I set it up with our um, ex-defense secretary, Dr. Liam Fox. And um, it's, the aim is just to nurture military personnel who come back from a tour of duty and um, to make sure that we, that we nurture the support network and the backdrop that, that is the family that they're coming home to. Yeah. And um, it doesn't necessarily have to be straight after a tour of duty, it can be um, years later and family can be however they define family we've sent a woman away who was suffering with uh, from cancer we sent her away with her dog she just wanted to go with her dog and it's they call them respite breaks and it's just this time to be in a sort of neutral territory it's not um you, you know you're, you're it, it's just time to purely be together and bond and for the children to reconnect yeah. with their parents for the yes. to nurture the the the, the main you know the marriage, the main, the the the, the, the unit, family. yes, unit, absolutely, and because, because, you know, it's nothing to do with how you stand politically. The fact is, is that these people are, are coming home from very traumatic situations, and yes. psychologically, the knock-on effect could be in years to come. It could be to the next generation, and so we just try yes. to, to strengthen the family unit going forward. And I mean, it does some really amazing work, and from the soldiers that we speak to and get feedback from. More than half of them are considering divorce before they go, and then it's ninety-six percent that agree or very strongly agree that it's that it's helped their marriage and um, and and encourage them to, to work on the, the family unit. And sometimes, yes, um, and to, to deal with the PTSD, yeah. and they'll say that it's the they can't remember the last time that they got a chance to play a board game with their father or go fishing yeah. with their father, you know, or all be together. Or, and yeah. so a lot of them are actually in England, um, the respite breaks that we do, um, because a lot of time the people, they don't want to pack up and travel far away again. They just want, yeah. to, they just want to be together. Exactly. And, uh, but, you know, with obviously everything that's been happening um, the past year, it's been incredibly tough for us. Like in, in 2020 alone, um, it, there were more than 50 trips cancelled affecting more than 200 people and thankfully uh, thankfully most of the companies that were s supplying these um, these trips or people with second homes yeah. have agreed to let us re rebook them but it's been very very hard not to be able to do what we do yes. it's a, and especially when you know that now is the time that they need it more than ever that's the okay. irony of it all and you, and you can't go anywhere so we yeah. changed we took a side initiative from give us time to to give us a moment when it was in England, you could go to places like the, the theme park. So you could go to places for a day. It, it's just it's just not quite the same thing. Yes. Um, and so I'm I'm really just looking forward to being able to 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 honour the commitments that we've made to these military families and, and give them the time that they so deserve. I mean, they've sacrificed 
all for, for our country and it's the very yeah. least we can do for them. Yes. So, yes, I, I just listening to you and uh, knowing it and, and basically seeing it all around me and uh, the same for me, our, our daily uh, routines during pandemic have changed and uh, as well as uh, the work for the support of the charities and I face the same thing. I support a number of important charities, children's education, cultural education charities and um, they have also been affected uh, tremendously and we are all trying to find the ways how to give back in a meaningful way and adapt to the situation. So kudos to you for uh, being as passionate as ever and finding the way and uh, doing your immense work. Thank you for that, from, just from me personally, um, Kitty. And so we, um, I would like to move um, into, uh, into a beautiful world of uh, Dolce & Gabbana. Uh, and your adoration of Italy, I believe, goes hand in hand hand in hand with your appreciation of the artisanal craftsmanship and this is where the Dolce and the house of Dolce and Cabana comes in and they uh, just um, for everybody to know uh, uh, Lady Kitty Spencer is the global ambassador for, Dol for the Dolce and Cabana and uh, I believe your first appearance with them, official appearance I think was in 2017 uh, continuing to into the opening of the Alta Moda I believe a show uh, in 2018 at Lake Coma. Yes. And I can amazing. only imagine I love Lake Coma. <laughs> and then, of course, on the numerous occasions since then and always, and you look absolutely incredible. Uh, I must say that you certainly represent uh, the universe of Dolce & Cabana with your classy, aristocratic, uh, charming, and, of course, extremely very feminine beauty. So uh, they're very lucky to have you. Can you, you please tell us a little bit your relationship with the house? Um, Long standing. Yes. It was it 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 developed very naturally because um, when I when I walked in that sh the show in 2017, it was the ready to wear in February, and it was the real people show. It was in that it was between the millennial and English rose sort of themed shows. They had the the English. Rose show in, uh, in in England, and then and they had this this one in Milan, which was my first. Well, it was my first time to Milan. It was my first fashion show. It was my first uh, experience with the, with Dolce and Gabbana, and it was, um, I mean, something I'll never forget. And it uh, was the start of such a of such a lovely relationship um, that's just developed naturally. And I think. I think these days that's what's important. That I, I think people, um, especially luxury consumers or fans of a brand, I think they like to see a, an authentic relationship or a long-standing yes. uh, shared values and mutual appreciation and respect and friendship. And I think it's um, it's very clear when something's a, a job or a role or when it's actually something that. It's a natural organically thing. developed yeah. as a friendship I think and that's and that's how and that's how it be, um, began because being um, a, a global ambassador I still can't even say I still don't believe it so I can't even but it was but that's only um, January this this year so the, all the rest of this time I, I mean it's always been this organic mutual just love we just we just fit and it's uh and it's been a really wonderful experience and i remember just always being so pleasantly surprised when i first came for the to, for the first show in, in 2017 i thought well it's such a big brand and such a big name and i was going into my fitting and i thought i bet you it was just probably hundreds of people and um you know and it's all going to be chaotic and it wasn't it was domenico and stefano and they said they said what what would you feel comfortable wearing and there was this room just like a treasure trove and i had no idea because i hadn't been expecting to even meet them and then i i hadn't been expecting you know that that my feelings and personality and choice would, would you know would be of of, of of value and um so i was so just um, 
touched and, and amazed by it all. And so, but I wanted to play it safe because I was so shy. So I just reached out and touched the nearest black dress and I said, <laughs> here we go. Um, I think that, you know, this will be, this will be perfect. Um, and I remember that they said, well, if that's what you want to wear, you can wear it. And then they said, but we were thinking this. So they pulled out this beautiful gold embroidered masterpiece. And I had never yes. seen anything like it in my life, let alone worn it or worn it down a runway. So that was a, um, a no-brainer. And, uh, and since then, it's, um, it's really naturally developed. We kept in touch. We wrote, uh, we wrote letters and I just... I love the family element to, to the whole yeah. to the whole setup here. You know, yes. I love that during the wedding, the the way that they embrace my family, the way that that my family loves them. It all feels like one big just family. extended team around me. Whether you know, it, it, it's just I feel really loved and supported by them, and it's um, it's a real. A blessing, really, a blessing. And it's definitely felt even through the, you know, the, I, I, you know, I, I've seen so many um, images and videos from this magical uh, event that just happened right now in Venice. Yes. And you feel the energy of people. It's not steep. It's just a simple fairy tale in the kindest expression of it, and with all these emotions and sentiments. And uh, I, it was, as I said, just really simply magical. Can you please? share with us a few um, moments from the events in Venice, recent events in Venice. Well, I think the thing that Dolce and Gabbana, the ultimate murder shows really just go to each part of Italy and uplift it and celebrate it. You know, whether if I think in September in Florence, they celebrated all of the local, um, the local craftsmen there and they had um, all of them on display, and I just thought that was the most elegant way to uplift the local artisans and the, and the yes. family businesses after such a terrible year with no tourism and 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 you know just really trying times for them. And so, what I always admire is the way that they go to each place and they celebrate the history and the, the, the iconic elements of that. And that's really what they did in Venice. And I yes. think it couldn't have been at, at a at a better time because. I think we're all we all are daydreaming and wishing we were in fairy tales after these past eighteen months, and and yes. Venice is really the the epitome of that in in, uh, in Italy. And uh, you think of drama and it's theatrical and it's and uh, beauty and and you think of getting dressed up and and the glamour. And so really to 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 see any of these places through Dolce and Gabbana's lens is uh, is an experience unlike any other. And and you will never see the place like that again, yes. um, despite how wonderful and beautiful it is anyway. Um, but to see Venice like that, I think, meant so much to people, whether they were there or not. The messages that I received on Instagram just saying, we're in lockdown in Australia, and just to feel a part of something, I think yes. it really couldn't have been um, a, a better, more magical setting um, at a time like this. And they as always just brought the magic to every little detail you know from the from the invitations that i always keep i have a box of yeah. every little uh, thing from every event um yes but it's just the, the detail of each event and the um the thought that's gone into absolutely everything yes. nothing has um has has escaped them so it's yes. just this sensory overload of the best of what that city is and the, the most magnificent platform in which to appreciate these Ultimoda creations. And it's um, it's really quite unlike anything. It really is like being in a in a in a fairy tale. Magic, and, yes. I mean even the gondoliers had uh, glittered uh, you know t shirts, the stripes were sequined and the yeah. and the hats had the beautiful the ribbon and every little thing it's a really just a real celebration and absolutely uh, and something and I believe, so wonderful to witness and i believe you studying in florence and knowing and being passionate about art i think your understanding of the craft, craftsmanship of dolce and cabana probably even enhanced your uh, relationship enhanced your understanding and the feeling and uh, you know i i was very fortunate um to uh 
I have a privilege. I had the privilege to introduce the first uh, some of the first pieces that uh, reached Singapore for the Alta Joleria collection just a few months ago. In Singapore, uh, I've hosted a, a several events a, a few months for Alta Joleria, and I was astounded by the incredible craftsmanship, incredible attention as is to the detail. The, uh, just every single piece is a piece of art, and it's a, it's a definitely a collectible. It's just a different level, and you can see the passion and love that every detail is uh, put That's into strong. every particular piece, depending on the region, as you mentioned. So that was something that uh, I was absolutely incredibly uh, surprised to see, because I could, really it's just very different. That event must have been amazing. I've, I've never yeah, been to well, Singapore, but I can imagine. I, you you know, have to come. I, yeah, I would. I would absolutely love to. And I. Um, um, but that event sounds like it was incredible. So you, we will hopefully uh, open doors, and we'll be able to do a little bit of a larger scale event. And who knows? Maybe one day the Venice show will be transported into Singapore for all the modern culture. Yes, yeah. because uh, as I, for, in Venice, uh, the activity started with the Alta Joleria, right? And the famous yes. Do, yes. Doge, pa, Doge Palace, so, uh, <laughs> which is a bit of uh, history on its own. And can yeah. you tell us a little bit uh, how, how did it look and what, what, how did it all start? Because the pieces were magnificent and the way they were showed in, encrusted in the Italian history, encrusted in the, the Venice uh, feel of the city, it was just mind-blowing. Yeah, I, I mean, what, 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 is, what a setting for it and what a way to, to experience um, the Alta Giulia. And I love the way that, that they're always inspired by the setting in which that jewelry is going to be shown. And uh, that I, I just was blown away. It's, um, like this year in particular, and, and the the jewelry that I that I was lucky enough to wear was just it was really just incredible. And um, and walking around and listening to hearing people's conversations and listening to how much they um, appreciate the, the the beauty of, of each piece and how everything is just done so perfectly by by hand. It really is just the finest example of Italian craftsmanship. It really is. Kitty, what is your thank you for that? And uh, you know, I, I'm still reliving this whole uh, footage and the images in my head. It's yeah. Extraordinary. What is your personal style? Uh, well, I, I hope it's sort of classic and feminine, and um, I, I, I tend to. I tend to, that's what I tend to, to be drawn to. I, I'm not really uh, particularly drawn to, to, to trends or to um, yeah. anything too short or, or, or revealing. I quite like demure hem, hemlines and I like things that are tailored beautifully. I like things to go in at the waist. And, so I'm in good company with Dolce & Gabbana. Oh, you are definitely in good company. But I, but and it, but then also every now and then it's lovely to wear something that's bold and that's fun. And so again, I'm in the right hands for that. So I think um, overall, I, I I I prefer to be overdressed than underdressed. And I and I love dressing up. It's really, um, you know, I, I I I love to to make an effort and express myself through what I'm wearing and um, and I think that it's a it's a wonderful joy in life and you, and you always look stunning and definitely express your personality through your style and your taste and it's very beautiful very classic as you said very feminine so uh, really beautiful I just before we finish I would like just just to ask a few short questions uh, but I don't want to take too much uh, more of your time, and I'm so grateful that you are with all of us tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that you love animals, and yeah. dogs in particular. Uh, tell us a little bit about your beautiful dogs or animals. Uh, well, they're, they're in South Africa, sadly, because um, I think even though during the lockdown you had some bad things yeah. to come from, you know kittens yes you, you want to you know uh but i think um I, it, it's 
wouldn't be responsible, for, you know, for me now to, to, to have pets. So yeah. hopefully now with everything opening up, I'll be traveling um, a lot more again. And, but, but growing up, certainly we loved to have animals and we always had yeah. plenty of cats and dogs. And, uh, yes, uh, well, kind people, they gravitate to animals because animals feel the energy and they give this energy back. Yeah, so my, my mother's a wonderful custodian of the yes. family, uh, you know, animals. And certainly when I go home to South Africa to visit her, it's one of the things I look forward to most. It's just pulling them all onto my lap to cuddle. Thank you. And uh, the last um, question, or perhaps uh, a little, little request. Uh, what would be uh, the profound message, an important message from your heart that you could give to all our listeners tonight, just as a uh, um, I don't I, I don't know that I, that I am uh, that I have you know. Well, you are very sincere. So whatever you say, it will come from your heart. So. Well, I think the the one thing that that I have always tried to live by, but have certainly realized over these past eighteen months more than ever, is just. To, just to treat people with kindness and to and to be gentle because I think um, more than ever we just need to show the people that we love that we appreciate them and to, to tell them every day and to hug them if we can and to and to just just really show the people that we love that we care about them I think you know life's too short not to yes very true thank you so much uh, from the bottom of my heart, dear Lady Kitty Spencer, for joining us tonight, uh, today, and uh, for all your profound, for your beautiful um, conversation and for your beautiful expression from the heart and your passion that you shared with us. And uh, uh, you know, I'm sure so many of our listeners learned uh, a lot as well, and they just basically discovered you uh, as a person rather than just looking at uh, your gorgeous pictures alone. So thank you, uh, everyone, for coming and, uh, and allocating the time to listen to the episode of Conversations with Olga tonight. The episode will be recorded, and I will post it on my social media as well as on the YouTube. And um, please thank follow you. me for more conversations. Follow dear Lady Katie Spencer as well. and. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and thank you for inviting me to, to you know, to be on. My, my honor. Hopefully, we'll see each other in. Singapore. Hopefully, we'll see each other. Absolutely. <laughs> I was supposed, I was planning to be actually in Milan with you now for the uh -huh. shows and all, but um, no family. Due person. to the restrictions, it's not that easy. So I'm trying to manage to go to Germany for now. Okay. But I will definitely see you at one point sooner than later and yeah. hopefully to welcome you in Singapore one day as well. Wonderful. And have a wonderful time with your you. mother and your children in Germany. Thank you very much. Really, really have a good day. Lots of Thank, you. Thank you. Very much. Lots of love. Bye. Bye.